You read between the lines. In other words, what is your right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? What does it mean to you? Think about it. Hick, the, you know, you can look at the exact words. The right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Ducky, what's that mean? I have no idea. Well, I'm telling you to start having an idea. Because when you have an idea, they got to listen. So you have an idea and you say, I have a right to travel freely and encumbered, right? Now, that a right so elementary was conceived from the beginning, <clears throat> all right? They're talking about the right to travel, okay? That a right was so elementary was conceived from the beginning to be necessary concomitant of the stronger union. The Constitution created. In any event, freedom to travel throughout the United States has long been recognized as a basic right under the Constitution. We've established that the right is clearly there. So you were right. You had a feeling that you had a right to travel, and you were right. There is such a right there, okay? One of the ways you could find arguments on that would be to go into the Federal Digest at the local library, go down by your Supreme Court cases, there'll be a set of red books called the Federal Digest right next to the Shepherd Citations. You look up the book called Words and Phrases, and in the book Words and Phrases, you ask for the right to travel. It'll give you every Supreme Court case that has anything to do with the right to travel, okay? One of the leading cases is this case, Shapiro versus Thompson, that it's such a basic right it doesn't even need to be mentioned, okay? Now... <coughs> It is important that you be able to back your arguments up. In other words, it's one thing to pick the argument up. Now, here we go. In moving from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, they were exercising their constitutional right, and any classification which penalizes the exercise of the right, unless shown to be necessary to promote a compelling government interest, is unconstitutional. All right? Now, the reality was they exercised their right to timely travel. All right? And the state didn't want to allow that. All right? Now, let's flip back here. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. First of all, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, right? We established that. Who said so? Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137, 1803. The Constitution of these United States is the supreme law of the land. Any law in conflicts, null and void of law. Now, we know that the Constitution is supreme. We know that the right is clearly established in Shapiro versus Thompson. Can a state, <coughs> arbitrarily and erroneously, convert a secured liberty in this case, the right to travel freely unencumbered, into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Obviously, we have decided that in Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, clearly, no state may convert a secure liberty into a privilege. Now, does everybody see how we plug that in? Just like on your computer, you, you fill in the blanks, okay? You have the court case. It says no state can convert the liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Well, what right are we talking about? The right to travel freely unencumbered. So you plug that in. So does the state have a right to require you to have a license for the exercise of that right? No. Does everybody see that? Now, what happens if the state requires you to have the license? Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama. You can ignore the license and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. Now, what happens if they pull you over? They give you the ticket. Well, you're going to go to court and you're going to fight it. You're going to file a brief. We're going to show you how to do that at a later time. <coughs> We'll show you exactly what to put down there. But these are the cases you're going to be putting down on your, on your memorandum of law as to why you have a reason to feel that you're right. First, that your constitutional right is superior to any law that they would put down. You have that right, and they can't pass a law that takes away that right. Secondly, if they do, it's unconstitutional. Thirdly, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, you can ignore the license and the fee and engage in a right with impunity. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama. And since you have not willfully done anything evil, you have relied on your Constitution and on the Supreme Court decisions, you have a perfect defense to the charge of willfulness. So you could not have been charged with willfully not going and getting the license. Does everybody see that? Okay. You have a perfect defense. United States versus Bishop, 412 U.S. 346, defines willfulness as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. Obviously, you didn't do that, did you? Because you have a perfect defense. You relied on previous decisions of the Supreme Court, Shuttlesworth and Murdoch and Marbury. You relied on your constitutional right to travel freely and unencumbered, pursuant to Shapiro versus Thompson. So you have a perfect defense. So now where are we at? <clears throat> Your Honor, may it please the court, I motion for dismissal with prejudice, failure to state a cause of action for which relief can be granted, and I would like to motion to dismiss, and I'd like my costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous case. That you have a right to collect your time for going to court, all right? You submit your bill, you submit your proposed order, you fill out your own proposed order. That makes the case go faster, and the judges kind of like that, and it intimidates the hell out of the prosecutor. 
when you do your own order. <clears throat> now, let's say, well, that's how you interpret that, sir. That's right, sir. That is how I interpret it. And 16th Am Jurisprudence, 2nd, section 97, says that it shall be interpreted in my favor because I am the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary to citizens for the protection of rights and property. See Briars versus United States, 273 U.S. 28. Unlawful, and this, that deals with an unlawful search and seizure, but it also deals that it's supposed to be interpreted in favor of you, the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary for the protection of your rights and property. So they got to enforce it in favor of you, right? Now, Boyd versus United States comes next. The court is to protect against any encroachment of constitutionally uh, secured liberty. It's their duty. They have no choice. They have to do it. Okay? All right. In Norton versus Shelby County, an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. Affords no protections. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as operative though it had never been passed. Now, after you write all of this stuff down, you casually say, Wherefore, Your Honor, I pray before this honorable court for your just and lawful relief. I ask that you dismiss this case with prejudice for failure to state a cause of action for which relief can be granted, and I pray the court for my just relief for having to defend this patently frivolous and spurious case, and I, my costs are whatever they are. You submit that on your order. I have an order. I have a proposed order, Your Honor. It's in my brief. At that point, they will turn to the prosecutor and say, Well, Mr. Prosecutor, what do you think you'd like to do about this? And most of the time, they're so overwhelmed at this point that they just go, I'll go for the dismissal, Your Honor. And the judge will give them some slack. Well, never before was a young man, not attorney, so literally overwhelmed when it comes for the prosecution, a licensed attorney. Now, it's not my goal to make attorneys look bad. My goal is to make you look good. <clears throat> my goal is to make you understand your Constitution. Now, if you happen to do it and you do it better than the attorney, God bless you. And God bless America. And if the attorney doesn't do his homework and prepare his case, I have no sympathy for him. Because he shouldn't have done what he was doing anyway. <clears throat> and if he'd have had any brains, he'd have pulled you aside and he'd have done what other attorneys have done to me and said, you know, I hate going against a prose litigant attorney. Almost always they're really, really good. And, you know, I never get to find out if they're really, really good or they're really, really bad until I show up and then it's too late. So I'm already on the diving board. And either the pool has water in it or it doesn't. And usually it doesn't. And it hurts when you hit the bottom. So they don't like going against you people. They, they will not like going against you. If you halfway know what the hell you're talking about, they're going to be intimidated. And they, I, I, have, I can tell you many, many, many tales. I... I had this one gentleman, he didn't have any plates on his car, and they called him into the court. And he was standing in the hallway, and the, ju and the uh, prosecution said, uh, Would you come over here, sir? I'd like to talk to you. He came in the office, and he sat down. And this party said to the prosecutor, What can I do for you? And the prosecutor said, Sir? He said, What can I do for you? He said, Well, it's not what you can do for me. I'm the prosecutor. What do you want to do in this case? Well, I assumed there was something I could do for you. You called me in here. Well, what do you want to do? How do you want to plead on your case? Oh, I don't intend to plead, sir. I intend to answer in a form of a demur, such that I do not acquiesce to quasi-jurisdiction, because that's an issue to be brought up in my pleadings and briefs to file with the court. The guy's mouth was on the ground. He said, are you an attorney, sir? He says, no, I'm a truck driver. The guy absolutely was in a panic. I had the same gentleman, the same gentleman, later he was working as a bricklayer, and he did the same thing. Told the prosecutor he was a bricklayer, and the guy's jaw was on the ground. See, they don't anticipate that people that are in other jobs other than theirs have any brains. And it blows their doors off when all of a sudden this bricklayer or this truck driver can come in and argue law, and all of a sudden it's like, shoot, this guy is good. I have to treat him like he's an attorney. So what did this guy do? The first thing he does out of the shoot, he walks up to the judge and he tells the judge, he says, Judge, I'm going to dismiss this case. Because he realized he was going to get hammered. And the guy, my guy says, he can't do that. I took the day off of work to come over here and battle. I told him, I said, shut up, sit down, and relax. You won. Don't say nothing. You won. And the judge broke out laughing because this guy didn't want to quit. The judge turned to him and he said, well, evidently the prosecutor doesn't want to proceed, sir. I'm going to have to dismiss the case. He is the complainant. <laughs>